Hey friends, next in our list of video essays on the Trumps in real life is The Magician. Now, to the Italians and the French, he wasn't a magician at all. He was the juggler, or the batteur. Either way, he was not a ceremonial magician, as beautifully depicted by Pamela Coleman-Smith, another one of my favorite images in the deck. There are a lot of cards I like in that deck, even though I fundamentally find it, um, something. <clears throat> one of the things I wish about the esotericists was that they understood how human we are, but of course they didn't because their aim was to transcend that. So I guess in a way they did understand how human we were, they just didn't want to deal with it and they wanted to be superhuman. Or closer to God, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> the problem is, however and whenever we're climbing the spiritual ladder, we still have to deal with the life that's being lived around us. And there's a lot of problems with being alive. Being alive. One of them is that we, most of us, have to hustle. And I guess that's a thing that this esotericist didn't understand either. Like I said in the video about the fool, the esotericists were largely really moneyed, privileged white dudes. So they didn't really understand that the hustler, the day worker, the, the journeyman was out there surviving life and didn't have time or as much time to think about ascending the spiritual ladder. Even at a moment in history where there were probably more religious people in the world, or let me clarify that, more Christians in the world active than at any other time. You know, the stranglehold of Christianity in the 1800s was greater than it is now. So of course, when the Golden Dawn and the esotericists got their hands on the juggler, they had to solve the question of who the hell this guy was. He couldn't just be a street performer. He had to be something much greater. And so, of course, we get the ceremonial magician. Ceremonial? Problem is, most of us aren't out there being the ceremonial magician. Most of us are out there trying to make our daily bread. And the batteleur, the juggler, knows that. They're out there working. They're out there hustling. Does it mean that the Golden Dawn version is bad? No, again, I feel like I'm gonna keep underscoring this to prevent comments about how rude and mean I am to poor, rich Arthur Edward Waite, but it doesn't mean that the Golden Dawn version that you know and love is bad. It means that contextually in life, most readings are not gonna be about ceremonial magic, at least if you're not reading for other ceremonial magicians. And if you detect in my tone some disdain, it's for the Golden Dawn, not for the idea of ceremonial magic. I don't wanna shit on anyone's personal spiritual journey. Even if it was inspired by the Golden Dawn, which as I mentioned is kind of problematic, it's your journey. But I do have some disdain for the Golden Dawn. They did make tarot popular, so ta-da. When I do see the Golden Dawn version, or the Waite Smith version of The Magician, I think of something I read in Rachel Pollock years ago about how that card serves as a conduit. It's a really powerful feeling in that image, and I think it is something that can be made practical. The idea that we become a conduit, not unlike a energy transformer, is a powerful one and happens in day-to-day -day life. If you have any creative outlets at all, you probably have moments where suddenly you go away and the art comes through you. Whether you're playing music or painting or writing or singing or building cars, whatever your creative outlet is, there are moments where you go away and the art takes over. And that image of the fool with one hand up and one down, sort of taking energy from the ether driving it through their body and forcing it into a result is gorgeous. Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote Eat, Pray, Love, wrote another book um, that I really recommend called Big Magic, and it's about living a creative life and writing. And in it, she talks about the idea of genius. Today, we think about genius as something someone is. Stephen Sondheim is arguably a genius. James Baldwin was a genius. Carol Burnett, Miles Davis, you know, these people who were the apex of their craft. But, Prior to modern life, genius was something you were visited by. You weren't a genius, genius came to you, kind of like a muse or the way we think of muses today. And so if you were lucky and you were open to it, genius might come along and make you exponentially more creative, more effortlessly creative. 
because anyone who does anything creative knows how hard it is to be creative sometimes. So the idea of genius, that old-fashioned idea of genius that Elizabeth Gilbert talks about to me feels a lot like what the Waitsmith magician or that interpretation that Rachel Pollock suggested feels like. That's a way that the, that magician can be practical in our daily lives. Now, it's kind of an impractical practicality, if you think of it that way, because we're not visited by genius very often, or maybe not all of us are, I certainly am not, especially the past two years, sitting down and writing that effortlessly, which I used to be able to do much more. Those days are long gone. <laughs> but it's a practical interpretation of a magical idea, and it ties in nicely with Elizabeth Gilbert's idea of big magic. But again, that's a rare exception in life. And even if someone is a genius, those are pretty few and far between too. But we also have to think contextually, right? So sometimes the magician represents that kind of big magic moment, that feeling of genius, that feeling of muse, right? But say it's in a reading where it's surrounded by eights, nines, and tens. Now, in the numerological system that I work with, eights, nines, and tens are all about effort and labor. They represent sort of a trio of doing work, trying to get work done and feeling exhausted by it, and then eventually getting it done. It's like Sisyphus finally pushing the rock over the hill, which he never really does. The idea here is that the context shifts, and so the magician, surrounded by all of those heavy cards, those effortful labored cards, suggests those times where the genius just ain't coming. Those times where every word on the page feels like a slog, those times when, for example, you're a YouTuber making a video and nothing fucking works. I'm not saying that happened tonight. Cuh. In that context, the other cards change the magician, and this is an example of how context changes meaning. And in the full video, I talked about how the cards don't mean anything, and even if you have this sort of idea of the magician as this big magic moment, when it's surrounded by heavy labored cards, even cards like the Emperor or the Devil, there's there's a different feeling to the card and it becomes less effortless and more effortful. So there is magic in the magician, there's power in the magician, but in order to use that power, in order to read it, we have to understand the context of what's going on in the reading. And even if we're using just one card, the context of the person's life. One of the things that happens too often in modern tarot is oblique spiritual bypassing. Spiritual bypassing is a thing you're going to hear a lot about if you follow the social medias. And there's active spiritual bypassing, which is the posting of memes that make no contextual sense in the lives most of us lead. This sort of vague, the secret sort of power of positive thinking bullshit that is really coming from a place of privilege. That can infect a reader who sees a card like the magician and says, you have the power inside you to do this. Well, maybe I have the power inside me to do it, but I struggle with anxiety and depression. I have a job that sometimes sucks the life out of me, and at the end of the day, I'm too tired to sit down and write. So maybe I have the power, but all these nines and tens are telling me I can't have access to it until the conditions of my life change, and those conditions ain't changing anytime soon. This is why it's important as readers that we understand both spiritual bypassing and the context of someone's life, not just what we think the card means. Sometimes in life we have to do what it takes to survive, most of us do, and that's what the magician prior to it becoming the magician was out there doing. Standing there on the street with their magic tricks and their juggling, trying to make bank. And it's important to have this in our pocket because that's a more realistic experience in life. It's important to know that people out there are struggling sometimes and that that's going to show up in readings. There are people who have to take what they have to work with and make it work. You know, whether it's as dramatic as Jean Valjean and Les Mis having to steal a loaf of bread to survive. Or just having to sell our talents to lesser goals in order to make bread. You know what I mean? I'm a writer. I love to write. I spend my days writing training manuals. That is not a gorgeous use of my talents. And I am talented, but I have to pay my bills. Paying bills is what the magician is out there doing. And that's helpful to know. The other thing that I love about The Magician when you think about it this way is that context shifts ethics. And that's a really ethically tricky thing to say, but I mentioned Jean Valjean stealing the bread. Sometimes what it takes to survive may not be ethically by moral standards, meaning the powerful standards, the standards of the uh, elite, Sometimes the magician has to do what it takes in ways that 
maybe you're questionable, but it's the gig. So that magician is going to do what it takes to survive, and they're going to do it regardless of whether or not you think it's the right thing to do. And in readings, this can bring out a lot of interesting nuances. If, for example, the reading is talking about your tactics in a situation, are you being forced to do things that are maybe a little left of center in order to get them done? Are you having to sort of bend the rules a little bit? What are the rules? Are the rules shifting too? It asks a lot of interesting questions about what's right in a situation. You know, what's interesting about the justice card we'll talk about later is that justice is not just for everybody. And the magician knows that. The justice card doesn't. So when the magician's there, we have to think about the tactics, but also again, context. So if someone's doing something that's maybe a little ethically questionable, what are the contextual reasons why? And if they don't do those things, will they survive? The magician is a survivor above all else. And that leads us into another shape of the magician that's really interesting. How the card functions in relationship readings. Whenever I see the magician in a relationship reading, I raise an eyebrow. Who's being sneaky? Especially if that card is connected to maybe the devil or the lovers, where in older decks there's three people involved. Who's zoom in who when the magician shows up? There's some manipulation that might be going on. Now again, context plays a part, right? We have to know the situation, we have to see the other cards in the spread. But the magician is wily, and the magician is not necessarily the person who's going to be the most forthcoming and the most trustworthy in all situations. They do what it takes to survive, and they do what it takes to survive by their standards. Whatever those are, doesn't necessarily matter. <clears throat> They're a survivor, and if you're gonna survive, you gotta look out for number one, and the magician's gonna do that too. But on the other side of that coin, it could also represent someone who's willing to do whatever it takes to make a relationship survive for positive reasons, not just for manipulative ones. So again, context matters. We have to understand the other cards around it and we have to understand the situation. But you can see how many ways the magician functions beyond that magical ceremonial manifestation that we're so used to with common interpretations of that card. As I said in the video about the Fool, whenever I teach, I like to ask people to tell me about the title of the card, not the image they're looking at. What is a magician? And again, because we've been trained to think this way, most people go first to ceremonial magicians. But eventually we get to the fact that magicians show up at parties and do tricks. Illusion, Michael. Mm. They're entertainers, they're show people. And so in that way, they can also represent performers and performances of any kind, which again is really interesting in relationship readings or any other kind of reading where performative actions may be interesting to know about, or whether someone's ego needs to be rewarded because they view themselves as a performer. This is certainly true if you're dealing with a relationship reading with a Leo. God knows we need to know how great we are at our performance, even if our performance is entirely sincere and earnest. All of this can feel overwhelming when you hear me talk about it, and it doesn't have to be. It's not so much about memorizing all of these things and always having them in you. It's about being open to potential when you're doing a reading and being willing to see beyond what we've been told about the card, particularly those esoteric paintings that have been so indelible in the tarot. When we're doing practical readings, we need to see them practically. And so what you don't need to do is sit here with these videos and write down everything I'm saying. What you need to do is understand the magician through your lens of life, through the way you see the world. And the way to do that is to go out into the world and see magician moments, just like we talked about with the Fool. You can do that with all of the cards. You don't need to wait for me to go through all of the videos. What I'm hoping to do here, though, is inspire you to see the cards in this way. The magician can be all of these things, but when you are open to potential, when you're open to the cards, when you're committed to context, the cards will start to tell you which version they're presenting in the reading. And the relationship between other cards, if you use multiple cards, which again, I'll suggest you do, helps you narrow it down as well. You know, like I said earlier, if the devil is showing up or the lovers and there's some question about fidelity, then the magician is cheating. But if it's showing up with the Two of Cups, maybe, and the, the Ten of Wands, then that might represent someone who's really passionate about making it work. So. I know I keep repeating the context thing, and sometimes it's a joke that I talk about so much, but it really is everything. Sometimes when we lay out a spread, we immediately start reciting meanings. And, you know, that works. It gets us in the neighborhood. But what happens when you just let the cards wash over you before you start speaking and start watching how they dance together and listening to how they talk to each other, you'll actually discover that they start telling you what they mean. 
in the context of the reading. And it's really a powerful thing. When we sort of forget everything we think we know about the cards and just let them be for a little while, we start to find out which version of the magician is appearing in this particular reading. What makes sense contextually, what makes sense with the other cards, and what makes sense logically given the question that we're working at. The idea that you don't have to start speaking right away, that you don't have to think of a tarot reading as a list of recited meanings, is really freeing because it allows you to do what we're really here to do, which is to divine, to use the translation tool we have to speak to whatever makes the tarot work. It's really powerful. And by the way, if you want a lesson in doing that, my new book, Your Tarot Toolkit, is really all about doing that. So I'll just go ahead and plug that. Next week, we're going to talk about the High Priestess, which is a really interesting card. It's one I struggled with for a long time. So hopefully that'll unlock some things for you. In the meantime, be good, take care, and we'll talk soon.